Welcome back to the McCann Dogs Podcast, Season 4, Episode 15. And today, Instructor Swanee and I are here in the studio, and I'm just going to give up on trying to call her Instructor Christine because <laughs> it just keeps coming out in tr- Instructor Swanee. And then I correct myself, and then I'm just calling her multiple names. So. How are you today? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I am excellent. Thank you. And I'm excited to talk about today's topic because we are going to talk about a whole bunch of myths and sort of quasi superstitions that come along with dogs. And we are going to dispel some of those myths and explain why those myths are not quite accurate. So are you ready to get into this? I'm ready and I'm I'm curious to... uh to hear about some of these uh, myths. Excellent. We've got lots of really great things to talk about. So um, to break the ice on this one, let's talk about this first one that I have on my list of dogs being able to tell when somebody is good versus somebody is bad. What do you think about that? Well, being that many years ago, my parents' house was broken into with their dog inside and the dog was loose and we're thinking the dog had a great time welcoming these people (laughs) so i am not so sure like maybe they were good people breaking in i i don't know but yeah i think the dog pretty much yeah come on in guys and here's all the good stuff throw me a ball and i'm happy Perfect. And I think that is worthy of a... (laughs) We'll say that that first one is a myth. So dogs are are fairly good judges of character. However, there are so many things that factor into this. And one being that dogs are tremendous readers of body language. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a person who approaches a dog and they're not quite comfortable with that dog, the dog is going to know that. They're going to read that in the situation. This is where dogs are really adept at picking up on the subtle cues. So if somebody is uncomfortable, the dog is going to read that body language and they are going to be weary of that person. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that person is good or bad. It just means that that person is not necessarily natural around dogs. Right. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So there we go. There's our first myth dispelled. Right. Now I do, I always do give a lot of credit though to my dogs. Me too. Yeah, I do. I always say, you know what? They really liked that person. Yeah. And I often find they are, but maybe it's, Maybe it's from us too. So I feel comfortable with a person. So, so does my dog. Yes. I don't like That's someone a good and my dog might pick up on that too. And so, yeah, it's fun. Maybe we're seeing things. And yeah. Yeah. For sure. Well, and I think too, with us, there is zero chance that we're ever going to be dogless people. Right. So when I meet somebody, if they're uncomfortable with my dogs, I'm immediately thinking, mm you're probably not going to be comfortable with my life because my dogs are a huge part of my life. So sometimes that sets the tone for things too, I think. Right, yes. Perfect. Mm. All right, that's a good one to start off with, I thought. Now, the next one is more um, going to be related to training. And this myth is one that we hear a lot all the time and it doesn't really seem to matter how much we talk about it. You really need to experience it before you can validate one way or the other. And that is that tugging as a game and as a fun thing with your dog Dog will make your dog aggressive. So what do you think about that one, Swanee? Uh, well, that is a very old wives tale. All I'll right, let's it. do this yes. already. <laughs> we'll already proclaim this one a myth, but let's dive into it a little bit. Why do you think it's an old wives tale? Well, I think people would ha- not have control over the game mm-hmm. and they would, you know, their, their dog would just go insane tugging at their whatever they had. And then it would go to dogs tugging on their pant legs, tugging on their scarves and the people couldn't stop it. And they'd say, you know what? It's the game making my dog aggressive, mm-hmm. not my lack of training making the dog seem aggressive yes for sure and we absolutely love tugging as a reward system as a game as a way to play and engage and interact with our dogs but i will tell you that we put a lot of rules around this so that we can enjoy tugging with our dogs Mm. and with those rules things like we start the game we end the game when we say out the dog needs to drop the toy etc all of these skills are things that we teach the dogs in little systematic steps to make sure that they understand how to play this game appropriately with us mm-hmm. and what comes along with that what do you think what do you think i'm getting at here what comes along with uh, imparting rules into things for our dogs well it 
trains our dog to listen to us. Mm-hmm. Is that what you're... I yeah. was thinking about the leadership the angle. The leadership, yes. Yeah, yeah leadership. absolutely. Mm-hmm. And good leadership is so important to all dogs. And when we provide them with that good leadership by being fair and by teaching them the rules of the game, for example, when it comes to tug, we are going to have a dog that cues on the fact that there are rules and things like that in life and they're going to develop emotional control. They're going to develop some uh, some respect and desire to work for us as well. And that leadership goes such a long way. Mm-hmm. So yes. um, have you ever refrained from teaching any of your dogs to tug? No, I've taught all my dogs to tug and uh, some of my dogs have been born tuggers. Mm-hmm. Other dogs haven't been born tuggers. And I've actually gone out of my way to teach that dog how to tug. Because I, I want to have that. I, I, I think it's a great game. It uh, expends a lot of energy. Mm-hmm. It tires them out. And it's a great leadership game, just as you had said. It is. And it's also a great reward mm-hmm. to use for dogs as well, so that we're not always reliant on food as our singular reward. We can mix things up and we can keep it interesting. Um, so talk about some of your dogs, because I know with my own dogs, I started with the Rottweiler mm-hmm. and then I got into Tollers. And there's a huge difference in the tendency of tugging with those breeds. For for the majority of my Tollers, I've had to work hard to teach them to be willing and happy in tugging hard mm-hmm. because they have softer mouths. Right. My Rottweiler, she was a natural born tugger. And I actually had to use tugs that had bungees in them Uh because she would, out of the blue, as she was tugging, she would thrash. And if I didn't have a bungee, it was so hard on my shoulder because she was so powerful and Mm -hmm. so strong. And I liked that she would thrash. So I didn't want to squash that as part of her tug desire. But I needed to make sure that uh, I didn't lose my shoulder or my whole arm. You could just see Quincy running off with an arm (laughs) attached to a tug toy. You needed two hands to tug with her. (laughs) Absolutely. So um, what 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 are your experiences with the different breeds that you've had in tugging? Well, my Malinois would have been like Quincy. They were like insane, crazy tuggers, just naturals. And (laughs) they would growl and carry on and they get their mouths would get all foamy. And, you know, they were it looked it it looked aggressive. It was like, oh, my goodness, look at this. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't. It was you had it under control. Yeah. And they were having the time of their lives. Fabulous. They're most fun. Uh, We use tug uh, as a reward at the end of a fly ball run. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine a dog running full tilt, hitting that tug toy. Oh, yeah. It, It can take you a few feet, too. Like it can, you know, drive you, you know, a few extra feet before you can stop. So, no uh, doubt. And especially you, you're not a very big person. So if you're watching us on the uh, podcast video, hello, you know, instructor Swanee is not a huge person by any stretch. So right. yes. Whereas um, my corgis were natural tuggers, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, my Sheltie wasn't really a natural tugger. Okay. My uh, Saluki wasn't a natural tugger. That doesn't surprise me too much. Honda, my Chinese crested, he was somewhere in between. He okay. sort of, yeah, he sort of could tug, but he was a very light tugger. If you put weight, you know, too much pressure on it, he's like, okay, it's yours. Go ahead, take it. <laughs> I don't want to fight with you. Right. You can yes, have it. Can oh have my it. goodness. Yes. Or this is too much work. <laughs> yeah. So along with those rules and then along with that, um, that desire to build the tug drive. Did you let, uh, did you let your Sheltie win in the tug game? Oh, lot? yes, yes, yes. It was Perfect. always a big deal when Atari won and she won more, more often than I won. And, uh, I remember my son playing with her and I'd always hear him going, Oh, Atari wins. Yay. Yay. <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> and it was just so cute. Yeah. Yes. And that's another fallacy that comes along with tug. A lot of the times we hear people say, Oh, I can't let him win in the tug game. And it, it, I mean that it really depends on the dog and what sort of training you've put in up to that point if they are still not clear that even if they win they shouldn't run away with the toy and play keep away then you probably do want to keep control of that toy and only let them win in a controlled fashion you know maybe you have a long line attached to the tug toy as Mm -hmm. well so that you can let them win and then encourage them to come back with it right yes i found that was very important to my saluki is letting her win and it was also very important to let her do the the little victory lap around me like i won i beat instructor christine and she would do this little (laughs) like I'm princess and she jaunt around with it, but then she'd come back to say, okay, yes. I've done my little victory lap. Play with me again. Let me win again. So <laughs> funny. Actually, you just um, made me remember when I was trying to get Ned to become a more involved tugger, uh, he would love to flop on his back and just pull the toy from there, which traditionally is not a really fun way to tug with a dog. But because he found so much value in doing that, I thought, 
all right, to mm-hmm. heck with it then. I'm going to use this to my advantage. And instead of trying to discourage him from that, I would actually let him roll on his back with the tug toy. And then I would get down and I would have a really nice little party with him so that he got to really enjoy that. And then eventually I sort of tapered that out so that he would stay on his feet to tug. But transferring that value from what he liked to do mm-hmm. to what I liked to do instead was uh, a really integral part of getting him to become a good tugger and a tugger that really likes to tug because he had a very soft mouth very very mm-hmm. soft he was um he was keen to retrieve with some work but right. in terms of tugging and and holding on to that toy he was he was exactly the same like mm-hmm. no no it's all yours yep, yep. no problem you can <laughs> you want it that bad you can have it <laughs> there you go so there's a myth right inside of our myth that uh that uh, you can't let the dog win with tugging there are definitely circumstances that you want to let the dog win and you right. want to oh, use sure. that yes. to your advantage yeah. and you can see like some dogs are just so proud of themselves when they win it's, absolutely it's just, yeah it's absolutely and we play that game and we have a blast with it mm-hmm. all righty my next one on the list here you've heard this i'm sure a bazillion times they know they've done something wrong they look guilty that is definitely a myth (laughs) totally a myth so here's the thing we already said this dogs are masters of body language they are so good at reading Mm. us and when we walk in the room and we see that they have shredded our pillow because we probably gave them too much freedom before right, they were yeah, ready or, yep. you know, maybe they had an accident on the rug or maybe they did something wrong in some other capacity. And we walk in and we see that and we're not thinking about our body language. We're having our natural reaction. And even if you're subtle about it, you still deflate a little bit or you mm-hmm. still get angry a little right, bit. Yes. Just, yeah. yeah. There's that little intake of. <gasps> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, right. And our dogs read that. They yes. see that and they go, oh, no, mom's mad. Right. I'm out of here. Yes. And they slink away. And uh, because we're humans, mm-hmm. we interpret that as oh, he knows what he did wrong. He's guilty. And then right. we think we can follow through with mm-hmm. some sort of correction or discipline at that point. And unfortunately, that just bridges your relationship so much further and it creates a bigger divide so what we want to do is set the dog up for success Mm -hmm. and not have those scenes where you walk in do you have any um do you have any stories of times where you've walked in and seen something go wrong well sometimes when you have uh, a little puppy in the house and your adult dog and uh you suddenly see the adult dog is is slinking around and it's like oh what what's happened they're acting really guilty Mm -hmm. and then i go in the room and of course my fault there's a little puppy pee puddle on the floor oh dear and the puppies you know hopping around having a great old time but the older dogs like oh pee on the floor means christine gets mad and just to look at the two dogs you would go oh the older dog's done it because look how guilty he looks he's slinking around the puppy's having a grand old time Mm mm-hmm but I know that it's the puppy who's done it and the older dog is just, you know, is is reacting, saying, you know what, this is bad news. Yeah. This is bad news. Christine's going to, I'm not going to necessarily get angry, but they're going to see that disappointment. Yes, they're going to feel absolutely. that frustration in me. And actually, I'm dealing with something quite similar right now in my house as the dynamic changes and Reggie gets older. Mm-hmm. Because at this point, he's going to be 15 in a few months. And he is at that age where sometimes he doesn't realize that he's pooping and it's just coming out of him. And of course, my reaction when he suddenly starts duck walking through the kitchen <laughs> and pooping on the kitchen floor <laughs> is usually more of a frustrated response. Right, and of yeah. course, he is deaf yes. at this point. So we're, I, not, we're not angry. It's no. just that, oh no, like, yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So my reaction is usually, oh my goodness, Reggie, what are you doing? And unknowingly to me until I started noticing that's creating some stress in Ned. So I've started to have to really bite my lip when this frustrating moment of Reggie having an accident occurs because the last time it happened, Ned was suddenly really stressed out and out of there. So he mm. took that cue and it wasn't even that I had reacted yet. It was just that he saw... Reggie right. doing his duck walk through the kitchen <laughs> and pooping. And of course, at that point, he recognizes that it's coming out and he's trying to get to the back door, which is through the kitchen. And Ned just went, oh my gosh, this is trouble. I'm right. out of here. And Ned can be a little bit sensitive mm-hmm. to my moods. So um, I can completely understand and empathize. And I have been working really hard to bite my lip and just 
go and clean it up and not have that reaction right. with Reggie yes. because it's not doing anybody any good. Right. Right. It's yeah. yeah. <laughs> Poor old dogs. Yes. Oh my oh. gosh. Yeah. But other than that, mm-hmm. he is doing very, very well at almost 15. So hopefully he's still around for a little, yes. little while longer yes. and we can still enjoy the other antics of Reggie. Mm-hmm. And keep the paper towel business in in, in good business. Yeah. The paper towel company's in business. Oh, absolutely. I think yes. it's very important to keep, that, <laughs> keep them going. <laughs> All righty. Um, this one's a little bit uh, a little bit less training related, but I think it's a good one to talk about. So the next one on my list, dogs are colorblind. Oh, that is that is definitely a myth. There are some colors they can see. Absolutely. Yes. So um, in terms of uh, dogs being color sighted or color blind, have you always known that they were color sighted? You've been in dogs since you were like. Well, I think, of course, when I was a a little girl, it was still dog saw in black and white Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, shades of gray, you know. So I I don't know. I don't know what age I was when I realized, you know, I probably, I guess, with more scientific research coming out, eventually Mm -hmm. one day I must have read an article that... I think it's yellows and blues they see well. Yeah. Yeah. So they have a different color spectrum than we do as humans. And I remember distinctly when I got this put in perspective. And I don't know that I ever thought that dogs were actually colorblind completely, but I thought maybe they saw colors closer to what we saw. And then when I got into field training, there is um, a retrieve called a blind retrieve. So basically the, the, the marked retrieve is a, is a bird that the dog sees fall down so they can pinpoint where it is, go out and retrieve it and bring it back. A blind retrieve is a retrieve that the dog has not seen fall. So usually at tests, these, these are placed out and you actually have to send the dog, you send the dog on a, a back command from your side and they're supposed to run straight out until you stop them and it's traditional to use a whistle to stop them and then from there you have you have casting directions with your hands so you can tell them to go back and over to the right or back and over to the left and this is traditionally taught with orange bumpers Mm. and I always wondered in the early days Mm -hmm. I always wondered why we used orange bumpers and it's because for dogs orange and green have the same tonal value so when you're using an orange bumper on grass they can't actually see it until they get right on top of it and they see the shape because it's exactly the same tonal value as the grass so that was a good learning opportunity for me in field work in the early days yeah Yeah. interesting yeah yeah there's actually um there's some interesting things out there if you google like dog color spectrum or something like that you'll use usually be able to find right. some pictures. I, yes, I think there's even an app you can put on your phone. Yes, there is. And then you can put your phone camera over something and see it like a dog would see yeah. it. Yeah. How fascinating is that? Yes. Eh? Oh, all these things we a- do. Another thing my dad told me, now I don't know cuz sometimes my dad pulls my leg, but he told me <laughs> <laughs> physically, literally or figuratively. Oh, I'm sure he has probably in the past. Um that birds see even more colors than we see. Oh. So there's a bigger color spectrum that we can't see that birds can see. Interesting. And that makes sense because they have to, especially birds of prey, have to see prey Mm -hmm. from quite a distance away. So they would have to be able to pick those things out. Right, yes. So many fascinating worlds out there. Mm. I'm actually, um, I'm about midway through this. There's a cat documentary on Netflix right now and I'm traditionally not a cat person. Mm -hmm. My mother was a big cat person. She loved her cats, Mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not a big cat person. I love my dogs. I might one day have a cat, but... Cats cats don't like you either. That's what I've heard. you know, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably true and I don't blame them because I always say I'm not really a big cat fan, but I do find animals in general fascinating and I watch tons of documentaries and tons of uh, animal shows mm-hmm. just to find out more and more about nature and things like that. And there's a really good cat documentary about training with cats mm-hmm. on Netflix right now and it has some very cool stuff in there. Well, I've heard cats are very good judges of character <laughs> and I've heard that they always run away from Instructor Shannon. Yes, and <laughs> You know what? Don't tug with your cat because it will make them aggressive. That's not a good idea. <laughs> We're feeding into cat myths right, here yes, on our dog yes. training podcast. Oh, I, th- I thought of an interesting one. I don't know if it's on your on your page Ooh, let's or, hear it. or not, but do you think that dogs just suddenly bite out of the blue? Oh, that's an excellent one. I will say <laughs> myth. <laughs> 
True. So there are certainly going to be medical cases where dogs have some sort of an imbalance where there might be some biting that happens out of the blue. But the overwhelming majority of times there's going to be signs and cues and things that we as humans have missed. Mm -hmm. So we end up with a dog that does bite and we don't necessarily see it coming. And then the... um, the information that comes out after was there was no warning and he bit out of the blue and you know there usually is a warning even if it's a very short threshold and even if it is a very subtle warning there usually is a warning and there's usually things leading up to that dogs Mm -hmm. traditionally um, tend to not want to bite they want to resolve conflicts without fighting because of course a dog fight can do extraordinary damage and can end up with one of the dogs even being dead or both of the dogs even being dead and instinctually most dogs want to solve things with other means rather than biting Mm -hmm. but of course humans are not always as good at reading dog body language as other dogs are right yes yes i i I always feel bad for absolutely dogs that you know family say the dog just bit our child out of the blue and then you know you you hear background while the kid was climbing on the dog the Mm -hmm. kid was poking the dog the kid had teased the dog yeah and you know the family had missed all the warning signals that the dog was uncomfortable with this and trying to get away and finally it was its last resort yeah it's so important that you train both your dog and your children to be tolerant of each other and to be respectful Mm -hmm. of each other so that's something that would be very near and dear to you we should actually have um a podcast episode coming up in the future where Mm -hmm. we talk about kids and dogs and we talk about some of the things because you'll have really good experience having Mm -hmm. raised a very uh very lovely teenager now Mm -hmm. who is coming up on 20 (laughs) soon right he turned 20 in september oh my gosh where does the time go i don't know i I don't know but he's he's an adult an adult I'm floored. Definitely, though, a good myth. Dogs do not bite out of the blue. And that sort of leads me to one of my next myths here, um, which is a dog is either a biter or not. Oh, that is similar. What do you think? Fact or myth? It is a myth. Woo! <laughs> well, I, you've probably gotten to the point now where you're thinking, these are all going to be oh, myths. We have to throw in one. We have to throw in one It's not a myth. <laughs> I'll have to think of one before the end of the episode. So dogs either being a biter or not being a biter. What do you think about that? All dogs are very capable of biting in the right situation. Yeah, absolutely. It is a defense mechanism. It is a communication skill. It is something that they will use when they feel it is appropriate. And in dogdom, it is something that at some point is legally appropriate for them. So in dog rules, in our human world, what we want to do is we want to build our dog's tolerances so we never push them far enough that they think they need to resort to biting. But every dog is capable of biting. There is definitely not a a dog who is not a biter versus a dog who is a biter. Right. Yes, you often hear people say, oh no, he won't bite. And inside you go until he does. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Uh, This next one, on my list is really interesting so dogs only yawn when they are tired that is a (laughs) i don't think we don't need the button anymore i I know but i like the button button. (laughs) (laughs) maybe we need to record you and put you on a button going (laughs) no you do it better do it That was pretty good, actually. <laughs> that sounded pretty similar actually, to the. Actually, I'm I'm leaving the dog training world and I'm going on to the sound effect world. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Perfect. Alrighty, so let's talk about that one for a second because dogs will yawn for a whole bunch of reasons. So, well, what are know, some of the reasons? Well, a yawn is a silent scream for coffee. <laughs> That might be my favorite new fact. I think that's more a human fact, but I love that. That is hilarious. And every time I yawn from now on, yes, I'm going to think of that. Scream for coffee. Yes. Perfect. Uh, dogs yawn often when they're under stress. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It is a calming signal that they will send out. It is sometimes it'll it'll be something that they find comforting in an avoidance sort of way. Yeah, so yeah. if they're looking for an out from a situation that they're not confident in, sometimes that will, you know, in their mind, buy them space and buy them time. Mm-hmm. So yawns are often related to stress, as Swanee had sa- has said. So if you are seeing lots of yawning with your dog, they might have just been up late watching the squirrels out the window, but chances the, the are... Squirrels. Yeah, the night squirrels. Squirrels after dark. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, for some reason, night court just flashed in my head, but I couldn't think of a good joke to go along with it. So yeah, if you're seeing that your dog is doing a lot of yawning, consider the circumstance that is going on and note that that might be them saying, I'm a little bit unsure in this situation. It's bringing me stress and I'm trying to soothe myself with that. So look at what's going on and see what you can adjust to help your dog build some confidence mm. in that scenario. Although there is an unwritten rule that when you see your dog yawn, you always have to say, Oh, big yawn. <laughs> I actually do that. It's a rule. It's an unwritten oh rule. Oh my gosh. You know what else I do? Big stretch. Big stretch. Yeah. Yep. One more. That's a big poop. <laughs> So I'll tell I, you, I have never said that one. I say that all the time to Ned and it makes me laugh every time. And I'll tell you a funny story. So I was over here at the McCann studio recording a video and I had a lav mic on my shirt and I finished recording the video. I said farewell to everybody and I went to walk Ned and unknown to me, I still had the lav mic on my lapel and it was still live and it was still connected and I was walking around the studio with with Ned and letting him, you know, airing him. And we were going for a little walk on the property. And uh, at one point he had a big poop and I said, oh, that's a big poop as I was picking it up. And then when I got back to the hall and I checked my phone, there was a message from Dan. <laughs> lots of links, Luton. For those of you who watch us on Train Station Live, you'll know lots of links, Luton. And Dan had sent me a message saying, hey, your mic's still live. <laughs> so I felt the need to go in and explain the context of oh, that comment. Right. Yes. <laughs> and that it wasn't just me in the bathroom. I think it was, that's what I'm thinking. It was you in the bathroom. <laughs> Oh my goodness. This seems like a great time to to plug our online our training, training programs. And if you want to join us for some personalized training advice and lots of really good jokes and lots of low-key fun, join us in one of our online training programs or in person for classes. Oh, you can come and listen to all the great jokes we in, have. Yes, yes. Especially <laughs> uh, if, if you ask for Instructor Steve, you will... Oh Get my gosh! Fill of jokes. Inst we have to have Instructor Steve on the podcast. Well, we should just so that he can go through some maybe of like, his best jokes. Maybe there's like a National Joke Day or something, and we can feature Instructor Steve. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Instructor Steve will have lots of really good things to add to the conversation. So I'm going to schedule him in, yes. so that we can have a sit and chat yes. with Instructor Steve. All right. Are we ready to move on? Ready to move on. All right. This next one is lots of fun and it's going to be a good educational one. The wag is always friendly. The that, tail wag. That is a myth. <laughs> I'm never going to get old. This this wah -wah never, is no. never getting old. That is absolutely a myth. There's a lot of reasons that dogs will wag their tail. And in canine body language, they are so good at conveying information. They're so good at this. Talk a little bit about some of the other reasons that dogs will wag their tail and some of the some of the things that you'll see in that. When dogs are extremely excited, their tail will go straight up in the air mm -hmm. and it will give these quick little quiver wags um it's it's not that soft friendly wag mm -hmm. it's more of a i am going to pounce on whatever in front of me or whatever <laughs> i see wag it's yes not 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 a friendly like yeah and you can see the whole intense body posture forward body posture very tense dog yeah so if dogs are stimulated by something they might be going into prey mode and chasing you'll see all sorts of things going on with that tail sometimes it's a little bit of a hesitant tail wag and that might mean they're feeling a little trepidatious about mm -hmm. things if their tail is tucked right under that's usually a pretty good sign that they are feeling really overwhelmed with whatever right. the situation is but there's lots of subtle movements in mm -hmm. that tail wag yes and the course there's the famous clear the coffee table tail wag too that is <laughs> yes. that was a very popular one when i had my saluki and my coffee table it was the perfect it was, it was a perfect storm a perfect storm oh also i don't know how old my son was maybe like four or something and that tail also was at the perfect face whacking oh my gosh and i don't know how many times my oh. poor child got you know happy cowboy would whack him in the face with her tail oh my and gosh. she had like a very thin whip like tail and i can only imagine but it was only a brief moment and then ty grew tall enough that it would catch him <laughs> in the chest instead of the face but i remember many tears 
Oh my goodness. Oh, poor t- it was all part of the bonding process. Yes, yes. All part of the bonding yes. process. <laughs> all right. Our next myth is. Oh, you gave it away. I did. Oh, I just Shannon. caught that. <laughs> so disappointing. Okay. This one's not a myth, maybe. <laughs> all right. The myth of the stubborn dog. Oh, Let's talk a little bit about the stubborn dog. Because this dogs. one. We hear that word a lot Mm. and it is a very natural word for humans to go to when they're not getting what they want out of their dog. So let's talk about the myth of the stubborn dog. What does this usually boil down to? Dogs do whatever is rewarding to them. And if they're not on the same page as you, they're going to do what they want to do. It's not that they're stubborn Mm -hmm. it's they don't understand what you want you're you're not presenting it to them properly you're not rewarding them for it yeah it's it's a very much a human emotion not a dog emotion absolutely and there are certain breeds that we want to be extremely tenacious for example terriers are often Mm -hmm. dubbed as stubborn because they are very intense on what they're doing and that's because we've bred terriers for generations and generations to be able to go into a hole and take on hissing rats and vermin and all sorts of little creatures Mm -hmm. that you know, are are scary in that moment. We've bred that terrier to say, I'm not afraid of you. I'm going to take you out. And we've bred them to be extremely determined to do that. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the terrier makeup. Right. So it's not that they're stubborn. Mm -hmm. It's that they're tenacious and we've bred that quality into them and we want them to be that quality so that we can help them do the work that they need to do. Right. And, you know, I mean, not um, most people in everyday life are not using their terriers as ratters, but there mm-hmm. are still lots of terriers out there working as ratters. And these instincts are very deeply ingrained in our dogs. And it is hard to override those at times and especially hard if you're thinking stubborn instead of just this is a breed trait and I need to channel it. Right. Yes. Or even just, you know, even a, a good old dog that you call to come in the backyard and he comes every time in the backyard because nothing, you know, there's nothing too exciting. But then the day that you take him out to the field mm-hmm. and suddenly he's in a new situation and he's sniffing a tree and you call him to come and he doesn't. And you say, oh, he's stubborn. Yep. It's not that he's stubborn. He truly doesn't understand that he has to come. Yeah. Dogs are very situational and coming in the backyard is a lot different than coming in the forest or in the field. Yeah. And I call that undertrained. And I find that uh, an undertrained dog is just as likely to get into some sort of a bad position as an untrained dog is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes this actually makes things worse because people have done a little bit of training and... Um, innocently so, assuming that the dog is going to learn in the same sort of manner that a human is going to learn and Mm -hmm. that they're going to pick up on all these things really, really quickly. And they might, in a specific situation, we always talk about starting in the white room so that the training that the dog is getting is, there's no conflict there. There's nothing that's distracting the dog from learning the thing they want to learn. So, of course, in that white room, they're going to do great. But that's not where you stop. Mm -hmm. So you start in the white room and then you add some color to the white room. You know, you might make it a light uh, shade of beige by Mm -hmm. adding some mild distractions and then continuing to build that skill. And then you make it a vibrant rainbow color by adding in more distractions. Mm -hmm. And then when you've exhausted the possibilities in that white room, you start to move to other locations that are going to provide more and more distractions and unique distractions and, and variability that you can start to teach your dog dogs you said it dogs are tremendously situational and what we need to do is we need to put them in a bunch of different situations before they can generalize those understandings something similar is i know how to walk and i think i'm a really good walker i think you're a pretty good walker Mm -hmm. however if i'm on a ship that's heaving in the waves i don't know how to walk on that ship and I'm not being stubborn about it. I just truly don't know how to walk on that ship. I don't know. I think you're probably being stubborn on some level. But, but yeah. so That's you an know, amazing analogy. Like, I love that. Yeah, I love yeah. that. But there is a way to, to walk on those ships. And, uh, you know, the, the sailors do it every day. But, you know, I am rolling along the, uh, the poop deck. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love that. That is a really great comparison. And hopefully that helps uh, that helps build some perspective for anybody who is thinking that um, they're frustrated with their dog because they're st- seeing these stubborn tendencies. And 
in any dog, it's just a matter of finding out what they find valuable. So some some fact finding, you know, some learning. Every mm-hmm. dog is a little bit different and they have breed tendencies, but uh, those only take you so far. And you really need to learn about each individual dog and what they like and what they don't like and then use that to your advantage. And we have some basic principles in dog training that we apply all the time, but there's always the opportunity to think outside the box and say, you know what? This dog isn't really enjoying what that dog over there is is loving in this class. Let's think outside the box a little bit and let's see what we can do to motivate this dog to do just as well as that dog over there is doing. Mm-hmm. All righty. Moving on in our list here. We are at my favorite one, and that is you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I think that is a definite myth (laughs) that is probably the biggest myth that we hear Um, we get a lot of people calling because they've not necessarily been proactive with their training or they're they're in a position where they have a newer dog to them but it's Mm -hmm. not necessarily a new dog Mm -hmm. you know they might um, bring in a rescue dog into their home that's already had some life experience elsewhere and there's no way to go back to that beginning stage and create the dog and mold the dog from scratch and Learning systems with young animals and young humans are always very primed because that's a function of our being, right? We're born and we need to suck in information so we can survive in this space. And if you look at animals in the litter and then beyond the litter, you will see that happening as well. And they're primed for learning in that young, in those young ages Mm -hmm. before they start hitting adolescence and start to to differentiate a little bit. They're primed for learning. So they're sucking it all in. So during those early stages, It is so easy to mold and shape the dog if you know enough to start training at an early age. But if you're not in that advantage situation where you can train from an early age on, you'll need to rely on teaching that old dog new tricks. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you for a fact that our older dogs love to learn and they might not necessarily have learning systems in place where when we start with our young puppies, we teach them how to lure and we teach them how to shape and we teach them all these great learning systems and that if they look to us for good things, they're going to get rewards and then we can filter that into our training and we can use that to our advantage. And our older dogs, you know, say you've brought a dog into the home and they're three years old and they've had no previous training. They come from a situation where, you know, they 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 weren't afforded mm-hmm. that possibility. You might have to start from the beginning in terms of teaching them those learning systems and it might be a little bit more difficult because they're not necessarily in prime learning mode. But once they recognize that this learning thing is valuable to them and all creatures love to flex their mm-hmm. brain muscles, there's there's I can't think of any creature. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, if you can think of one, but I can't think of any creature that wouldn't love to use their brain. Well, I think I I'm not going to say, it, <laughs> but I was going to say I've met a few people <laughs> that. Yeah, that might. (laughs) You know, you might be right, but none of our listeners, of course. (laughs) All of our listeners love to learn, but our old dogs love to learn as well. And, you know, young, young Ned is always primed for listening in my home and is always primed for learning. But old Reggie as well, when I've got his attention, because he's stone deaf, when Mm -hmm. I've got his attention and he thinks that there's something to do and something to be learned, Oh, he is right in there like a dirty shirt and just can't wait. And uh, in my experience with bringing dogs into the home that I haven't necessarily raised myself, they also absolutely love to learn once they realize what it's all about and that Mm -hmm. it's valuable and fun and it's mentally stimulating for them as well. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Well, I think that that was a really fun episode to talk about all these myths. Do we have anything we can pretend isn't a myth? Okay, Shannon, I got one. Okay. You should never feed a dog cheese in the moonlight. Oh. Myth huh. or fact? Oh, I think that's, that's I think that's probably a good fact because what if they turn into a werewolf at that point? That's true. <laughs> Does cheese make dog <laughs> There's a new myth. Cheese there. in the moonlight will make dogs yes. into werewolves. Right. Yes. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Oh, actually. Yeah. Um I thought of one. Okay. That's actually, no, it, it's, it's, well, I'll let you, I'll let you decide. Okay. You decide. You, when you get a brand new puppy, you should give it tons and tons and tons of exercise. Ooh. 
I would say that's a myth. That is a myth. That <laughs> is a myth. Young puppies, their their joints and their bones mm-hmm. aren't fully formed, and uh, they have what's called growth plates that mm-hmm. aren't closed. So too much exercise to a young pup can damage them. Absolutely. And it all it can also add overstimulation to your long list of tasks that you're going to need to work through with a young puppy. And it can make things much, much more difficult if you're having to deal with overstimulation. So I always like to talk about um, exercise for the young puppy or the young dog in terms of both physical and mental stimulation. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I tend to keep the physical stimulation to much less than I keep the mental stimulation. And the mental stimulation will tire out the dog so much better and so much more thoroughly than the physical stimulation will. And I also like to point out that when we are training for a marathon, we start from square one right. and we build. So if I do 15 minutes of running one day and then 20 minutes of running the next day and then 25 minutes of running the next day, that is because I want to build my athleticism and I want to build my ability to keep being energetic in these situations so if you think about what you're doing with your young puppy by just giving them tons and tons of physical exercise well it may tire them out in the moment but it's going to make them need more and more the next day so Mm -hmm. keep that in mind it's definitely a band-aid fix there yes good one good one to end on all right on that note i'm instructor shannon i'm instructor christine happy training I hope you enjoyed this episode of the McCann Dogs podcast. And if you'd like some more training resources, be sure to check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at McCann Dogs. And if you'd like to train with us online, be sure to check out the show notes below for our My Dog Can online training program, where we know in just a few weeks, your dog will become a well-behaved family member. Until then, happy training.